Amen. Lord, you are a living hope today. Thank you, Lord, for the spirit that is in this room this morning, the Holy Spirit that is with us on this very important day that we do not forget. Your word tells us, Paul reminded us to remember this continuously. Remember this. Jesus, you told your disciples to remember me. Remember this. And so, God, we remember. Today, we set aside this day on this Resurrection Sunday to remember, Lord, the grave is empty. And because of that, Lord, our sin that has held us down, that has limited us from our abilities to serve you, God, as we have been broken free from that. The chains have been broken. And he who the sun sets free is free indeed. Bless us, Lord, as we continue to look into your word this morning. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Why, my certain title this morning it is impossible to keep a good, this good man down. Impossible to keep this good man down. Many people have tried to keep this good man down. Harry read the scripture in Matthew 28 earlier, and it talks about how at the end the, the leaders, the religious leaders had tried to, to get the word out and even paid off the, 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 the soldiers to say, listen, they came and stole the body. I'm sure the soldiers didn't appreciate that too much. They kind of, you know, can, yeah, they're kind of getting paid off to, to, to take the hit on the situation. You know, can you imagine on their resume? Yeah, I'm, you know, I was the one that was guarding Jesus. Too. Oh, you're the one that, you know, they stole the body. Okay, all right. You're a great soldier. Yeah, you're a great guard. Yeah. Well, we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. And literally, right now, in different time zones, millions of people have come to church sitting in different places and perhaps under trees and different continents and celebrating this Easter service, many for a religious duty to, to do it because that's what Christians do. They go to church on Christmas and they go to church on Easter. A survey done a number of years ago, people were asked why they would go to church only for Easter Sunday, but not for the rest of the year. The, the answers are quite interesting. 75% said there's no value in attending church the rest of the year. 81% said the church has too many problems. 48% said they don't have time to go. 42% say they're simply not interested. And 34% said the church has become irrelevant to their everyday life life. This morning on this Resurrection Sunday of 2024, I want to say that there's nothing more important, nothing more relevant, nothing more life-changing than this message of the resurrection. Amen? That the grave is empty, the stone has been rolled away, that Christ has been risen from the grave just as He said He would. It literally has changed our world. The year we are in of 2024 is based on the life of Jesus in the year of our Lord, 2024. Jesus has changed our world forever, and we must never forget that. And I want to remind ourselves this morning that without the physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus, our faith, our hope, our salvation is completely and utterly useless. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 to 19 Paul says this, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sin. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most pitied. Isn't that true? If our hope is only based on this life that God gives us, then we, what are we doing? Because if you're really serving God, it's not an easy life. There's persecution, there's pain, there's suffering. Why would we experience that, that if only for this hope of this life that we have victory? It wouldn't make sense. You would still be in your sins. Those who have died before us, they would be lost for eternity. There's no hope for them. That the only hope for this life that we have is this life, then what are we doing? And we should be pitied more above all men if that's the truth. There were those who would say, well, it doesn't really matter if Jesus physically rose from the dead. As long as he touched one's life, 
As long as you live by his principles and values of loving your enemies and doing good to those who hate you and turning the other cheek and all those wonderful little teachings that he gave us, as long as you live by that, that really is all that matters. And to them to say, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that's completely fine. You can still have a faith in God. But the truth is, there's no hope in their salvation. In fact, Anyone who believes that is literally on their way to hell with a, with a positive attitude. Think about that. They're making their way to eternal damnation with a positive attitude and turning the other cheek because the, because the grave has defeated Jesus in that case. If you're a person this morning who's here only because you feel it's your duty, because it's Easter Sunday, and that's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. And this is my prayer that you today would encounter the resurrected Jesus. When you have an encounter with the resurrected Jesus, how many know it is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week experience? Amen? It changes everything about your life and how you view life in general, how you view people, how you view yourself, how you view your, f- your future. Without the revelation... Without this reality consuming your heart and your spirit, you are serving a dead, crucified man. You are still living at Golgotha's hill. You're still there admiring the love and sacrifice of a dead prophet and teacher, but you have not encountered the resurrection, resurrected Jesus. You see, the resurrection changes everything. It's the only thing that stands between us being condemned by God and being accepted by God. It is a pivotal point between sin and salvation and heaven and hell. It is His resurrection that is the the hinges on the door to heaven. Amen? Without His resurrection, that door cannot open. Without His resurrection, you are still lost in your sin and you are eternally damned. That is why throughout the ages, men have continually tried to discredit disprove, undermine the resurrection of Jesus. So, because if they could prove that Jesus had not risen from the dead, then that would completely undermine the Christian faith and make it completely null and void. And man throughout history has tried to do that. Dr. Greenfield, he's a royal professor of law of Harvard University many years ago, Long passed away. One of the greatest legal minds that ever lived. He wrote the famous legal volume entitled A Treatise of the Law of Evidence, considered by many the greatest legal volumes ever written. Dr. Simon Greenfeld believed that the resurrection of Christ was a hoax, and he was determined once and for all to expose it for what it was, a myth. Yet after thorough examination... The evidence of the resurrection, Dr. Greenfield came to the exact opposite conclusion. He wrote a book with a very long title, <laughs> An Examination of the Testimony of the Four Evangelists, evangelists who, of the Rules of Evidence ad- Administered in the Court of Justice. That's a big, long sentence. But he had to write this book because he had to tell people that he was wrong and that the Bible is right. For he says these words, It was impossible that the apostles could have persisted in affirming the truths they had narrated had not Jesus actually raised from the dead. Josh McDowell, who was a known Christian apologist, back in the early 60s, he was a university student who was an agnostic, who was an atheist perhaps, and yet his Christian peers, his Christian student friends began to taunt him and say, listen, you got to believe in Jesus. This whole atheist thing is, 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 doesn't hold water. And yet Josh McDowell in his stubbornness says, listen, I am going to prove you wrong. And he began to do a paper called The Evidence Demands a Verdict. And at the end of writing his paper, he had to come to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus is historical fact. And he says these words, after more than 700 hours of study, studying this subject, I have come to the conclusion that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is either one of the most wicked, vicious, heartless hoaxes ever created in the, created in the minds of human beings, or it is the most remarkable fact 
of history. Sir William Ramsey spent 15 years attempting to undermine the credibility of Luke's account of Jesus' life, death, death, and resurrection, and yet in the end concluded by saying the following, Luke is a historian of the first rank. This author should be placed among the very greatest of historians. Jesus' character has been tried, scrutinized, challenged, yet over and over and over again, each and every one of us have come to the same conclusion. All the evidence states that Christ has indeed risen from the dead. Amen? Amen. Jesus said he was the Son of God. And it's one thing to say you are the Son of God. It's one thing to prove it. Jesus said he'd be risen from the dead. It's one thing to say it, and it's one thing to prove it. And so this morning, I want us to be, imagine ourselves in a one big courtroom right now. And I am the defense lawyer and presenting the evidence and, and the star witnesses to the star witnesses to prove, uh, with the star witnesses to prove the skeptic judge and jury that Jesus has indeed risen from the dead. I'll put you on that jury. How is that? You are. I am the defense lawyer defending the evidence. And my first bit of evidence that I want to give to you this morning is Jesus said he was going to do it. Jesus said that he was going to do it. Let's begin by setting, getting the testimony of eyewitnesses. How many think eyewitnesses are the best ones to have? We talked about in Sunday school this morning about the Muslim faith and how there were no eyewitnesses to experience even that Muhammad existed that those who actually wrote the Quran were not even there, didn't even live during his lifetime. The Gospels are eyewitnesses. They're saying, we were there. We saw it with our own eyes. We know the, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he says, there were even 500 people that saw him alive at one time. He says, don't take my word for it. Talk to some of them because most of them are still alive, he says. Eyewitness after eyewitness after eyewitness saying, we saw him alive. The first witness I want to give to you is Mark. Mark chapter 8, verse 31 to 32, we read the following. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Jesus was proclaiming, this is what's going to happen this is what's going to take place. He said, listen, he was talking about it. He was revealing this reality that this is what's going to take place. Matthew, in chapter 26, verse 31, then Jesus told them, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after this, I have, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. We also have the witness of John. The Bible says that John says that the, he was the one that the, the Savior loved. I like how he says that about himself. The one that he loved. And he writes in chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it up again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he was spoken, uh, that he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, he, his disciples recall what he had said. Then they believed the scriptures and the words that Jesus had spoken. The next eyewitness would be Luke. Some historians believe that Luke was one of the 70 sent ones. In Luke chapter 24, it says, it says that Jesus was on a road, and he met up with some individuals. It says here, on that, now, that same day, the, Jesus that, the day that the tomb was empty, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they were talking and discussing these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing to, together as you walk along? 
They stood still, their face downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that had happened these, in these days? And I love Jesus' response. Here's a resurrected Jesus. What's his response? What things? Tell me, what happened today? And I'm not going to go through it, but they began to talk about all that took place, about his execution, about the betrayals that took place, and the hideous death that he had to go through. And then in verse 25, Jesus looks at these men, and he says to them, how foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And, be, and, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, realize this story that God had, had, ordained, had ordained was from, from the foundations of the world. Genesis chapter 3 prophesied that he would come and, and he would, that, he, that, his, that, that his, his heel would be bruised and yet Satan's head would be crushed. And he goes through the prophets, Moses and all the prophets, and explains to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him, himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, saying, saying stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went inside and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. Can you imagine, can you imagine being there that evening? What? Did, did you, was he just with us? Each of the Gospels proclaimed that Jesus did indeed raise from the dead. And as eyewitnesses, they believed this to be the de to the degree that each of them were willing to die for their faith in Christ. Jesus knew that he had to do it. He knew what he needed to accomplish. His whole life, his whole aim was to go to the cross. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. As I've said many times, the joy that was set before him was you and was me. Our salvation, the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That man needed redemption desperately and that it was only through his death and victory over the, over the, and over our death that we, could, that we could have victory through the cross of Calvary. The second bit of evidence that I want to re re present before you this morning is the, the empty tomb. The empty tomb. We read in all four Gospels that when the women came to the tomb on the third day, that they found that the stone had been rolled away and that the tomb was found empty. We read earlier in Matthew 28, Harry read earlier, he said here in verses 11 to 15, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers large sums of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the Governor, we will satisfy him and keep him out of, and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And the story has been widely circulated amongst the Jews to this very day. Just like back then, today there's people trying to explain, desperately trying to explain how Jesus was raised from the dead. I remember hearing one report years ago, and I thought, man, they're really doing. They're desperate trying to figure out how Jesus raised. I hear one gentleman saying, you know, the body was not literally dead when they took him off the cross. That, that he actually was unconscious. So they took him down, they put him in the tomb, and the temperature in the tomb was just at the right temperature to, 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 to waken him up from that, from his slumber. He just fell asleep, that's all. And he was raised to life that way. And people do everything in their... How many think those Roman soldiers were experts? In fact, when Christ was crucified, he died first. There's three crosses. 
He died first, and, and it, was, it was custom to break the legs of each of the crucified so that they would, they would suffocate. Their bodies would collapse because their legs are not supporting them anymore. They would, they would fall, they would suffocate, and they would die very, very quickly. But the Bible says when they came to Jesus, he had already died. You'd think they would have thought, well, you know, maybe he's unconscious. Maybe we should break the bones anyways. They knew he was dead. They, they knew what a body, dead body looked like. They knew when the spirit left the person. They knew that. They're, they were experts. People will try over and over again to try to convince us that the, there's some explanation as to why Jesus was, why his body has, was out of that tomb. I love what Josh McDowell says about this possibility. He says, on the Sunday morning, the first thing that impressed the people who approached the tomb was that the, un the unusual position of, of the one and a half ton stone that had been lodged in front of the doorway. All the gospel writers mention it was in such a position that it looks as if it had been picked up and carried away. Now I ask you, if disciples had wanted to come in, tiptoe around the sleeping guards, and then roll the stone over and steal Jesus' body, how could they have done that without the guards awakening? And if you still think that this is a possibility, ask yourself, what kind of men would these guys be? Willing to lie, willing to write about it, willing to write these gospel messages? over a lie, and willing to give their lives for this message, all for a lie? Think about that. These same gentlemen who, like Peter, who said, Lord, I'll die for you, I'll, 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 I'll pay the ultimate price to protect you, as soon as Christ was arrest, arrested, he was running for his life. The Bible says only John stood at the cross watching Jesus be executed. The rest of the disciples, they scattered. They were hiding. They were behind locked doors. They were afraid for their lives. And so you're trying to tell me, all of a sudden they had this incredible revelation that they went from hiding to say, hey, let's get together and let's go steal the body now. I'm sure the Roman soldiers won't notice it. We'll sneak right in there while they're snoozing away. It makes absolutely no sense. At all. By the way, the stone was one and a half tons. It took more than a few little disciples to move that. The last bit of evidence that I want to present before you this morning is the resurrection was foretold. Isaiah 53, 700 years before Jesus was even born, I read this on Good Friday, I'll read more of it this morning. The prophet Isaiah prophesied about Christ 700 years into the future that he would come. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who is, but who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, die between two, th two, th two thieves, and with the rich in his death. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and, and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord made him his life an offering for sin, he, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in the land. Speaking about his resurrection, after he had suffered, has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. What did he say the last words on the cross? It is finished. God's judgment, God's justice is satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many. How many here amongst the many? Anybody here? Your sin's been justified. And he will bear their iniquities. Hallelujah. Anyone can look at that and say, well, that's just coincidence. Did you know that? I mentioned this before, but you know that in the Jewish culture, the Jews who do not believe, they call that chapter the forbidden chapter. They do not like to read Isaiah chapter 53. That if you'd actually go to a Jewish person right now who knows the scriptures and you'd read Isaiah 53, many of them wouldn't even know it because they know the book of Isaiah, but they wouldn't understand chapter 53 because they don't read it. 
It's offensive to them because it talks too much, sounds too much like that Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, Peter now filled with the Holy Spirit, no longer the frightened denier of Jesus as he was just weeks, uh, weeks earlier, says to the crowd of thousands, in verses 32, verses 32 to 33, and then 36 to 38, I'll skip to there. He says, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. Therefore, verse 36, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent, be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When you are confronted with the evidence of the risen Savior, you really only have two choices. To either you continue to reject it and say it's just a myth, it's just a wives' tale, it's just a fairy tale, where it means nothing to you, or, or you have to respond to it. Like Josh McDowell, like Dr. Greenfield. And like Sir William Ramsey, you have to say, listen, I need to I need not only acknowledge his existence, but I must serve the Lord. Josh McDowell was just a young man in the 60s when he came to that conclusion. Had to admit to his peers they were right and he was wrong. And he gave his life to Jesus. And to this very day, he is, has a ministry for the sole purpose of defending the gospel. His son is now taking his ministry over from him. It's going on to the next generation. There's something that happens when we are confronted with the resurrected Jesus. It doesn't just, it doesn't just cause you to want to go to church on Resurrection Sunday. It should cause us to all year long, all day long, know that he's the one guiding your life. He's the one that saved you, and he's the one you were called to serve. Amen? So on this Resurrection Sunday... 2024, as we partake in communion this morning, the Bible says we're called to examine ourselves. And what that means, we're called to search our hearts and say, Lord, where is my heart? The Apostle Paul, I mentioned this before, I believe in our last service with communion, where the Apostle Paul, he had to come to the conclusion that he personally had to serve the Lord because of what he experienced. He never saw him personally, but he experienced that revelation on the road to Emmaus. And now as the Apostle Paul, as the one who had his name changed from Saul to Paul, preaching the word and having to confront a Corinthian church who began to take it for granted, he said, listen, listen, don't mock the name of God. Don't mock God. Don't take it for granted. But when you come together, do this in remembrance of him. Do this. Never forget what it's all about. So many churches, they forget all year long why they exist. They forget why the church is even in the world today. We are here to proclaim not just Jesus, but the resurrected Christ. Amen? That's what we are called to preach. A lot of people are talking about Jesus and a wonderful guy he was. I heard many, many years ago that Jesus is either one of three. I've used this illustration to people who just talk about Jesus as a nice guy, whatever. I say, no, 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 you can't do that. Because either Jesus is a liar, lunatic, or Lord. Amen? He's a liar saying, I am the Son of God, and he knows he's not. I'm going to rise again, and he knew that he couldn't. That make him a liar. And definitely, if you're a liar, not a very good person, are you? Or he could say... He was, a, he was a, the son of God because he was a lunatic. A lot of people could say that. David Koresh, divining and cult back in the late 80s, he did that. 
You said he was the son of God, the FBI. If they kill him, he'll just rise up again. We're still waiting for David Koresh to rise from the dead. He was a nut job. <laughs> he was crazy. Jesus was not crazy. He talked about his resurrection. He says, you don't take my life. I choose to lay it down and pick it up again. So you have one option left, don't we? You can't be a liar. You can't be a lunatic. Therefore, he's Lord. And if he's Lord today, what does that mean to you personally? How does that affect your life? Because the day will come, people, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Every knee. And some that acknowledge him will have to go to eternity lost, separated from God forever and ever because they have to say, you are Lord, but I didn't serve you. And there are those who have to say, Lord, I served with all my heart. And he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. That's what this resurrection season is all about. Amen? That's what makes us so a joyful experience because the truth is, it's not about us. It's what he has done for us on the cross of Calvary. And all we can do is say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I will serve you, Lord, with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And each of these disciples that were eyewitnesses to what he had done, they were willing to go all the way. Every one of them executed, executed, executed for serving the Lord. Only John survived to an old age, but on an island isolated from everybody where he got the book of Revelation given to him. And he died isolated on an island. Why? Because he saw the risen Jesus and he was willing to die, separated from his friends and family for his faith in Jesus. Amen? When you are confronted with the reality of Jesus, it it changes you. Amen? It's in there. It changes everything about you. You say, Lord, I will serve you. I will honor. Father, this morning as we partake of communion together, Lord, lead us and guide us into this moment. We do not want to take this lightly, but Lord, we consecrate our lives to you once again and say, Lord, I remember what you've done for me, Lord. I will not take it for granted, but I will surrender completely to you, Lord Jesus. Lead us and guide us in this moment, a moment of reflection, a moment of appreciation as we remember you, Lord Jesus. We give you praise today. Amen.